tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about domestic revenge and outdoor oddities. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Jordan B. and Brandon Faircloth are voice talents Olivia Steele and Jonathan West. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to... Turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Jordan B. and is performed by Olivia Steele. In our first round of fiction tonight, we'll meet a mistreated housewife whose big dreams led to disillusioned nightmares as she waded through the murky waters of life and love. She devises ways to create her own happiness and freedom, but will it be more than she bargained for? Without further ado, I present to you Boneless Tide. Once a month, the boneless arrives on the tide. It's a force of nature, like quicksand. You can't reason or argue with it. All you can do is barricade your home and stay indoors. Us islanders know when it's coming. We recognize the signs. Now and again, an outsider comes to visit and brushes off the warnings. They think we're all simpletons, or in some sort of crazy cult. When I was a kid, maybe seven or eight, a rich man from the mainland laughed in my mom's face when she told him the boneless was on its way. Mom said half the island warned him to stay inside, but he didn't listen. He even boasted about how he was going to leave his bedroom window open that night, acting all smug like he was proving how stupid we were. Now the nurses wipe his ass and spoon feed him three times a day. It's hard to get away from the island. As a girl, I dreamed of leaving, of seeing the world, but mom got sick and someone had to take care of her, so I quit school. Next thing I knew, I was grown and married to another islander, a fisherman. Fast forward a few years, married life didn't turn out quite how I envisioned. Unfortunately, Mom had a very what-will-the-neighbors-think attitude. See, here on the island, fishermen are well thought of. They're like royalty, and it means divorcing one is like a cardinal sin. Mom buys into the whole shtick, of course. It's hardly surprising. She was married to a fisherman for 20 years. Unfortunately, it meant any time I tried to talk with her about my problems... She took my husband's side. Oh, he's out on the boat all day working hard, she'd say. I'm sure he doesn't mean it. He's just stressed. I had the same problem with your father. Things will get better soon. Just wait and see. 
when I'd turn up on her doorstep with a busted lip or bruised neck. She'd brush it off. Oh, the storms took a turn for the worse. I'm sure it's tough for him out on the waves. I'm sure his mood will pick up when the weather does. Just wait and see. Wait and see, wait and see. That was her answer to everything. I was sick of waiting and seeing, and I was sick of my husband, and the whole damn island. All I wanted was a fresh start. For years, I dreamed of doing something, anything to change my situation, to get out of my rut. Well, tonight, it finally happened. The day started with a passive-aggressive note from my husband. Go down to the market, get some supplies, and tidy the house. It's arriving tonight. I'll be at the docks until sundown. Figures. The fishermen are always the first to know. I remember when I was a kid, Dad would take me out on his boat and point to the rainbow-colored sparkle sitting on the waves. That's how we knew the boneless was due for a visit. At midday, I went down to the high street. The islanders were in an uproar. All the merchants wanted to close up early and get home safe, but the shoppers were desperately trying to secure some last-minute provisions. I wandered from store to store, fighting my way through the crowd, picking up the essentials. At the pharmacy, I asked the cashier for some sleeping pills, told him they were for my mom. She always had trouble sleeping when the boneless is here. Poor thing. He rang them up. You best rush home and get locked up as soon as possible. It won't be long now. I will. And give your husband my regards. This time of year there's nothing out at sea but choppy waves and dangerous winds. Lord knows he needs a decent meal and a warm bed at the end of the day. I brushed my hair back, exposing the black eye my husband gave me for talking back last night. For a fraction of a second, a flicker of concern flashed across the pharmacist's face. Then he looked away and started restocking shelves. I resisted the urge to laugh, as if anyone would ever dare speak a word against a fisherman. We said our goodbyes, then I started home. Along the way, as I walked along the coastal path, I stopped to watch the ocean waves. Above the surf, rainbow-colored sparkles twisted and twirled. I stood there in a trance-like state, contemplating what I was about to do. An elderly man gave me a nudge on the shoulder. I nearly screamed. Best not to hang about, he said. There's not much time left. Get home quickly. Don't dawdle. I sighed. Yes, yes, thank you. Further inland, police officers wandered along the cobblestone streets, screaming at people to get indoors. Two of them broke up a gathering of teenagers and shooed them off. I entered my house, made sure it was properly secured, then cleaned it from top to bottom. When everything was ready, I went into the bathroom and practiced my smile. It looked ingenuine, although that was nothing new. I didn't think my husband would notice. Or care. Honey, would you like a glass of whiskey? I said to my reflection. My voice sounded high and peculiar. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> Honey, why don't you have a glass of whiskey? I heard someone say there'd been some choppy waters lately. I thought you might appreciate a little reward for all your hard work. Much better. I waited for my husband, glancing at the clock every now and then. He wandered through the door a little after five and locked the front door. Without saying a word, he tossed me his gear. I hung it up in the closet while he wandered around the house, checking everything was properly secured. Experience had taught me it was best to wait for him to get settled before saying anything. He sat in the armchair and kicked off his boots. Tired? I asked. Course I'm tired. What's for dinner? How's cod sound? With some potatoes and peas. He held a newspaper in front of his face. Fine. Just try not to burn it this time. I took the steps down to the cellar and flicked on the light switch. Pressed against the stone wall was the freezer. At the far end of the room were the double doors that opened onto the street. 
held together by a metal chain and padlock, the key to which hung from a nail in the wall. I lifted some cod out of the freezer and tucked it under my arm. I carried it into the kitchen, got everything ready, and shoved it in the oven. Then I poured my husband a glass of whiskey, ground up three sleeping pills, and mixed them with his drink. I brought it to him. He turned the paper downward and raised an eyebrow. I heard someone down at the market talking about choppy waters. I thought you might appreciate a little reward for all your hard work. He lifted the glass, downed it in one, and snapped his fingers for another. For a while, I darted back and forth between the kitchen and the dining room, doting on him. When he finished the second glass, I poured him a third, then a fourth, and a fifth. Once dinner was ready, I set two plates and lit a few candles. We didn't talk. We ate. Occasionally, his head nodded back and forth. I held my breath each time. Unfortunately, he kept snapping out of it. He'd shake it off, then return to his food. After he finished the main course, I fetched him a piece of strawberry pie, plus one last drink mixed with two more pills for good measure. He gulped it down without so much as a thank you. For a few moments, we sat in silence. Sweat beaded down my face. Eventually, he took himself into the sitting room, back to his favorite armchair. The clock above the mantelpiece chimed. It was getting late. The boneless would arrive any minute now. I was cutting it close. Real close. My husband's eyelids fluttered. Then his head finally slumped forward. Quietly, I approached the armchair and pulled the newspaper away. Out like a light. Perfect. I grabbed my handbag and coat, then raced to the front door and unlocked it. I didn't have much time. The street reeked of rotten flowers and spoiled flesh. The aroma was so intense it stung my nostrils. I took a deep breath, held it, then walked forward. There came a sickening splat from the end of the street. For a fraction of a second, I looked over and saw it. The boneless. I was too late. The glare blinded me. As I held up my hand to shield my eyes from the light, I had the most wonderful feeling of serenity, a knowledge that everything would be alright, and that I wouldn't have to worry about my husband or the island ever again. Soon, it would all be over. My hand trembled. No! Screamed a voice from the back of my head. It's a trick! I'd taken several steps forward without realizing it. With a deep breath, I turned away. A chill ran down my spine as I became aware of a horrible writhing sound, like bugs crawling over one another. I raced back to the front door and tried to slam it shut, but couldn't. Something blocked the frame. A slimy, luminous white blob spilled through the gap. I didn't dare directly look at it. Not again. The door creaked open as the blob expanded, filling the space between the door and frame. With my eyes facing forward the entire time, I raced down the hall. From the sitting room, there came a loud thud. I opened the door. My husband was on the floor, a puddle of drool leaking from the corner of his mouth onto the rug. The room lit up as the writhing sounds followed me. I bit my bottom lip, clenched my fists. I saw the glow of the boneless reflected in the picture's frame mounted above the fireplace, the stench was so strong it made me dry heave. There was no escape. Soon it would all be over. I had a lifetime of being a vegetable to look forward to. Maybe they'd put my husband and me in the same hospital bed thinking that's what we'd want. I had a sudden idea. I rushed forward towards the cellar. My husband stirred. The last thing I saw before exiting the room was him shaking his head. He screamed but not for long. His voice quieted. Then became a terrible gurgle. I resisted the urge to look back. I made my way down the steps into the cellar where I grabbed the key mounted beside the doors. 
My hands trembled so violently it took three attempts to get the key in the padlock. The writhing sound grew louder and louder until it was with me in the room. I unlocked the padlock, then unwrapped the chain from the handles. For a moment, I felt something warm and pulsating touch the back of my ankles. My whole body shivered. At the last possible second, I pushed open the double doors and climbed onto the street. Then I got up and ran. I ran halfway across the island toward my mom's house, where I unlocked the front door and pulled it open. I locked it behind me, pressed my back against the wall, and burst into tears. It was over. I was safe. A light came on at the top of the stairs. I wiped away my tears and climbed to my feet. My mom appeared, still wearing her nightgown, and asked what had happened. I said I was worried about her and came to check that she was okay. We embraced. She asked about my husband. I told her he was safe and sound back home, that I'd cooked him his favorite meal and then came over to check on her. She insisted she make up the guest room and try to lead the way. I kept telling her I would do it myself until, finally, she relented. I helped her back into bed, then I gave her a kiss on the forehead. I love you, Mom. She rubbed my cheek. I love you too. In the kitchen, I helped myself to a bottle of wine and broke down in tears. Again, I kept thinking about what I'd seen and heard. The awful sounds my husband made played in my mind again and again. I kept thinking about what I could have done differently, about whether there was another way, a simpler one, one that didn't involve anyone getting hurt. I felt a growing knot of guilt in the pit of my stomach. But it's too late to change anything now. Now all I can do is wait. There's no way I could sleep. Not even if I wanted to. At sunrise, the boneless will depart. Then I'll make my way down to the docks and sail my husband's boat to the mainland. I'm finally ready to leave this damn place and never look back. By the time anyone realizes what's happened, I'll be long gone and starting my new life. I can hardly wait. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Recently, I talked to you about BetterHelp in terms of dealing with the stresses of tax season, especially with deadlines approaching in April and May. And if you're in business if, and you're closely tied up to that stuff and you have to work with it, and uh, it can be stressful. Add that to your daily stresses, it can get overwhelming sometimes. That's why BetterHelp was created, to help you, and they've helped me. Well, with spring here and change in the air, and literally things are changing all around us, some of that can be stressful. That's why I recommend BetterHelp. BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist that you get to start communicating with in under 24 hours, and you can send a message to your counselor anytime. If you're like me and you deal with daily stress that can really affect your job performance and maybe affect your home life, BetterHelp is just the thing. In fact, so many people recently have been using BetterHelp, they're now recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. BetterHelp just works. You can find out for yourself. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash chilling. You can join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thanks for visiting our sponsors. We and they really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed Boneless Tide, as written by Jordan B., and performed by Olivia Steele. If you'd like to see more of Jordan B.'s work or hear it, they've been featured on our official horror fiction site, creepypastastories.com. You can also check out more of their terrifying tales on their profile on Reddit, where they post under the username JTB685. 
As for voice actress Olivia Steele, more of her work can be found on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as her own YouTube channel, Scarily Olivia. Be sure to check her out when you can. I assure you, you won't be disappointed. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by Brandon Faircloth and performed by Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 2017 Evil Idol voice acting champion, Jonathan West. In it, we'll be introduced to a man taking a trip down memory lane, reminiscing about his childhood best friend and the stories he used to hear his family tell while on sleepovers. One tale in particular becomes especially prevalent as he finds that it's followed him into adulthood, leaving him with his own terrifying tale to tell. Now, without further ado, I present to you why my father went into the woods. My father was a careful man, meticulous even. He lived a life that was well measured, and if some considered him bland or dull, he didn't seem to mind. He was moderately successful in his business. He was moderately well thought of by the community we lived in. When my mother went missing, he was, to anyone that might observe him or inquire, moderately worried and sad. He was the same with me. Reasonable, patient, and generally kind in the unfocused way you might expect from a pleasant doctor or taxi driver. A detached civility and courtesy that had more to do with how my father was than how he felt about me. Not that I complained. Even when I was younger, I had enough sense to know so many kids had it worse. When my mother was around, they got along well enough, though he seemed to feed her the same brand of love as me. A bland, almost flavorless thing with an artificial aftertaste. I was 12 when she disappeared, and as much as I missed her, I was somewhat preoccupied by what would come next. Because I had known for some months that occasionally, just every few weeks or so, my father would go out into the woods. It never occurred to me to follow him, or to even question internally why I didn't consider doing so. My fear of my father was like background radiation. Invisible, but ever present since I was old enough to understand that something was wrong. Eating and mutating me slowly enough that I never stopped to wonder if everyone lived so tight with tension and foreboding, perpetually waiting for the other shoe to drop. When I saw him going into the woods one winter afternoon, I wondered if the time had finally come. He never went into those woods. He wasn't the outdoorsy type, as he was quick to point out as he pulled his lips away from dry, polished teeth, and nod in that precisely affable manner that he had, a mannequin making the motions of a real man. He was just home from work, but an hour earlier than usual, which was odd in and of itself. When he parked and turned toward the trees instead of the house, I couldn't help but watch from my upstairs window, heart beating a little faster as a voice whispered to me that this was it. This was it. He was starting to unravel and now we were going to see the thing that lay behind those placid smiles and cool pats on the back. The thing that made mom flinch when she heard the door open at night and made me stay in my room when I was home alone with him. I was terrified, but also relieved because at least it would be over. Except it wasn't. He went deeper into the woods until I couldn't see him, and after an hour, I gave up watching. When he came inside later that night, we didn't comment on his lateness, and neither did he. I went to bed half expecting to wake up to screaming, or not at all. But no, everything was fine. It was the same, except that occasionally, just every few weeks or so, my father would go back out into the dark that lay between the trees. That continued until my mother vanished, and after a period of disruption where people searched and questions were asked, our lives went back to a form of normal. The dread I felt was constant now, but it was also an old and familiar friend by that point. 
I escaped to school or friends' houses when I could, and TV and books when I couldn't. For his part, my father left me alone past the threshold of attention and affection he felt he needed to show. His trips into the woods continued as long as I lived there. As soon as I graduated high school, I moved out and across the state to college. I went home that first Thanksgiving and Christmas, but after that, I never went back. He didn't mind. He'd call to check on me once a month, always the first day of the month at 8 o'clock, and other than that, we never spoke or saw each other again. I went back home to see his funeral and to put his affairs in order, but nearly everything had already been done for me. He died in the backyard of a sudden embolism, but you'd think he'd known the moment he was going to go. Every corner of his life had been tucked and folded, lines even and corners crisp, much like the envelope he had left for me. It wasn't some heartfelt message of love or loss, and it wasn't a confession of some dark secret life. It was just a single line written in my father's small, neat script. It begins with the dreams. I rented a hotel for the two weeks I planned to be back in town. The house just wasn't an option. I couldn't stay in that place again. Just walking in felt like putting my foot into quicksand, and I could feel the hands of that past me reaching up and grasping at me, hungry to pull me back down. So I slept in a hotel room that could have been like any other hotel room in any city in the world. And for the first couple of nights, it worked. Then, I started dreaming of the woods. I'd toyed with the idea of going into the woods since I'd gotten the call of my father's death. It had been years since I'd gone deeper in than the edge of the yard. I already spent most of my playtime away from home, and after I saw my father go there, it wasn't even a consideration. That was his place now, and whatever he did there, I didn't want to know about it. Maybe I would have just chalked up my dreams of picking my way between those dark and tangled trees as residual trauma dredged up by stirring the muck of my childhood. But on the fourth day, the day after the first of the dreams, the estate lawyer gave me the envelope with my father's last words. When I pulled out of the parking lot, I headed away from town and back toward the house. I was a grown man, and I wasn't wasting another day being afraid of letting that strange man poison my life. My heart still hammered as I stepped into the woods, but I was determined. I could see the ghost of a trail ahead of me, and I followed it, further and further, past a small creek and across a field to a deeper part of the wood that was thicker and swampier. The mud sucked at my shoes as I went and the air was more humid, but also deathly still. I'd have expected insects, but there were none. No bird sounds or furtive motions beneath the strange plants that grew here. Everything was silent. I had the thought that I had stepped back in time, a frozen moment from some ancient swamp, oxygen rich and teeming with unseen life, life that was hungry and powerful lying just beneath the black mud, watching me, perhaps, or suspended from the enormous bows of the gargantuan trees that twisted overhead, the nightmare king of some dead dinosaur's forgotten memory, but somehow alive and ready to be remembered. I blinked and looked around. Where was I? What was I thinking about? I... My eyes fixated on the muddy bank I was standing in front of. In the middle of it, as though it had been excavated like a fossil, was the thing I felt sure my dream and my father had sent me to find. It was a brass fortune teller machine. I glanced around again. I had to be miles away from the house. How was that even possible? The woods weren't that big. Less than a mile and I should have hit the highway. I tried to swallow, but my mouth was too dry. My body felt desiccated and hollow, just bone and dry skin and terrible will as I walked closer to the thing half buried in the hill. It was five feet tall, all polished wood and brass, though the metal was tarnished and the wood had just begun to bleach and speckle after time in the wet and the sun. The top three feet were a glass cube containing the torso of a puppet woman 
dressed in a headscarf and gold jewelry. Her painted green eyes regarded me from beneath arched, knowing eyebrows that told of knowledge of things unseen. Above the glass, the brass arched into an arabesque roof framing a small sign of red and gold stained glass. I couldn't read it at first, but then it lit up as a soft violin began to trill from a speaker grill below the fortune teller. I was startled, but I didn't jump or step back. I was transfixed. Looking at the red lettering of the glass, I read the words glowing there. The voice of Eridat. Ah! I let out a small scream when the fortune teller began to move, waving metal arms over a glowing crystal ball resting in front of her. The violin picked up speed, growing louder and more insistent, the insectile trilling of some long dead song. My skin prickled as excitement began to grow in my belly, spreading up into my heart and head, down into my groin. A small tray popped out on the front of the machine, and from it a milky white card jutted out. I didn't hesitate in reaching out and grasping it, pulling the card free from the silky strands that held it in place with some effort. On one side, there was a strange symbol that I didn't quite recognize, as though I'd seen it in a dream. On the other, there were only two words. Offer yourself. I let the card flutter to the mud as I saw motion next to the machine. There was a hole beside it. Somehow I hadn't seen it before, but it was there now. Less than half the height of the fortune-telling kiosk, and thick with shadow, and more strands like those that had trailed from the card when I took it. There was no fear or confusion. I knew what had to be done. <sighs> of course I knew. I was doing something as old as rain, or the sun rising, as sacred as being born, or taking a life. I knelt down and crawled toward the hole, keeping my eyes lowered as I reached it and lay down, rolling over onto my back as I scooted myself forward, pushing my head into the moist darkness beyond. Once my shoulders touched the sides, I waited, holding my breath, as I began to worry that I had done something wrong. But no. A coolness came to rest against my cheek as an inner darkness within that gloom came to greet me. I began to cry as that coolness dug into my skin as a voice told me to keep my eyes closed, not to look. I couldn't see it, not even a shadowy glimpse, or I'd be lost forever. I lay in the muck, head surrounded by shadows and webs, as its icy weight settled over my face. When I left the woods, I saw a sheriff's patrol car parked behind mine. I was going to try and ignore it, but Sheriff Haverlin got out and met me at my car. We had met briefly two days earlier when I'd run into him at the funeral home, and he had seemed a jolly and affable man at the time. Now, I could see beneath that, and I knew why he was there. Everything going all right, Kenneth? Need anything for the service tomorrow? My offer to give you an escort from the church still stands. I nodded. I appreciate it. I don't think many people will be at the funeral, so traffic shouldn't be a problem. Raising an eyebrow, I studied him. Is that why you came? To offer help at the funeral again? He shrugged and gave me a small smile. Partly, yeah. That and will uh... I just thought I should warn you. I felt my jaw tightening. Warn me of what? The sheriff puffed out a breath as he looked down the road. <sighs> your dad will uh... He's your dad and he passed. And I don't make a habit of talking bad about the dead, but... He met my eyes again. He was a strange man, and I'd be lying if I said me and the others around here didn't wonder if he was up to more than he let off. I frowned. Up to what, exactly? You talking about my mom? You never found any sign he did something to her, did you? Or that she had done anything but abandon us? Shrugging again, he nodded. No, you're right. But it was still odd. No one that knew her expected her to leave like that, and we never saw any sign of how or where she could have run off to. It's natural to suspect foul play involving the husband in something like that, you understand? He pulled at his bottom lip thoughtfully. But it wasn't just that. 
These past 20 years, we had people go missing. That always happens sometimes. People move, run away, or get themselves killed. But since I was a deputy, we had three times the number of people go missing here than any other surrounding areas. I know because I checked. I stared at him. Okay, so what are you saying? Do you think my father had something to do with any of that? Haberlin let out a short laugh. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. Though I admit I did wonder a few times over the years. He only gave me an odd feeling, your dad. Nice enough fella, but I could never tell what he was really thinking. He smiled fell away. You look like him, you know? I didn't see it the other day, but, but I do now. I glanced past him to the swaying greens of the woods. I appreciate the sentiment and the offer of help, but I really do have a lot to do today. Was there more that you needed to tell me? When I looked back at the man, his face was troubled. Just, uh, if you find anything going through your dad's stuff, things that don't belong or don't make sense, something that might belong to someone missing, oh, well, I don't know, anything that feels wrong, he swallowed. If you find anything like that, let me know, yeah? I gave him a smile. Not too friendly or happy, but not too cool or hard, as I nodded. Sure thing, Sheriff. I'll be sure to do that. Seemingly satisfied, he stepped back from my car. Well, I'll let you get back to it. I know you want to get done back to your life. You're living in uh, Colorado, right? I paused in opening the car door to glance back at him. I did, yes, but I'm going to be staying here now. Haverlin raised his eyebrows. Really? Well, I got the idea the other day you were hot to be done and on your way. What changed your mind? I studied him a moment. You know how it is. The past is a powerful thing. I guess I just realized where I am. A distant wind kicked up behind the man, rustling the trees and pushing him hard enough to make him have to catch his hat. Fumbling with it awkwardly, he looked back at me. Where's that? I sucked in a deep breath. The air smelled rich and thick with a dozen different scents. I smiled slightly at the fear I smelled coming from him. Home. I hope you enjoyed Why My Father Went Into the Woods as written by Brendan Faircloth and voiced by Jonathan West. As a reminder, you can hear more of Jonathan West on our official YouTube channel. If you check him out, be sure to give his performances a thumbs up, leave a kind word, and tell him you heard him here on this program and that Steve sent you. It would mean a lot to me. And if you dig Brandon Faircloth's work, simply search for him on Amazon, where you'll find his many books for print, including his fantastic short story collection, The Joker's Wild or visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash faircloth, spelled F-A-I-R-C-L-O-T-H, and you'll be redirected to his author page there, where by clicking through via that link, a small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we're proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. In the Joker's Wild, you'll discover tales of dark rituals and old gods, of devices and pacts that exact a terrible price, and of childhood terrors and the slow trickle of blood dripping from that van. The book includes 24 new stories by Brandon that will pull you deeper and deeper into what he's dubbed a, quote, midnight world filled with horrors that will haunt you far past the final page, unquote. So don't delay. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash faircloth and pick up your copy of The Joker's Wild today and let Brandon know that Steve sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of tonight's talented authors and of indie horror. And with that, listeners, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go... I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. 
and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Roshek. Logo by Craig Roshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.